At this time, it is our pleasure to introduce to you our morning keynote speaker, Mr. William Fox. Mr. Fox is the Global Financial Crimes Compliance Executive for Bank of America, one of the largest financial institutions in the world. He is responsible for the company's financial crimes, corruption, and economic sanctions efforts. Prior to joining Bank of America, Mr. Fox served as the Director of Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, also known as FinCEN. Appointed by Treasury Secretary John Snow in 2003, Fox was the FinCEN's fourth director and led the administration of the Bank Secrecy Act, which authorizes the collection, analysis, and dissemination of financial information important to the prevention of money laundering and ter terrorist financing. Before his appointment as the FinCEN director, Mr. Fox served in the Department of the Treasury from 2000 to 2003 as Dep Associate Deputy General Counsel and Acting Deputy General Counsel. After September 11, 2001, he served as the Principal Assistant and Senior Advisor to the Treasury's General Counsel on issues related to terrorist financing and financial crime, which he received a meritorious rank award. Prior to his service at the Treasury, Mr. Fox served at, for 12 years at the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms in various positions, including Deputy G Chief Counsel, during his tenure at ATF, Mr. Fox provided legal support to large um, criminal investigations, helped oversee ATF's regulatory program, served as a legal point person for ATF's alcohol and tobacco diversion program, served as, uh, worked on several important legislative initiatives, and served as principal legal support for the United States Trade Representative's Office for Wine Trade um, between the EU and other wine producing countries. Mr. Fox received his bachelor's degree in history and a law degree from Creighton University. And in 2005, US Banker Magazine named him one of the most uh, influential people in high finance. Without further ado, Mr. William Fox. So it's, um, it's always a little uh, strange to hear that read back. <laughs> um, um, I, I, um, it's, it's been a, quite a ride, which I'll talk about a little bit in a second, but I, I wanted to, uh, Dean Hendrickson, distinguished faculty, students, business community leaders, um, I can't tell you what an honor it is for me to be here today, um, to be back here at Creighton, um, which um, I think the theme of this, this talk, if you'll hear it, is, is that Creighton probably more than any other institution um, has influenced my life and my career, and, and I think and I think when I saw the theme of, of the conference um, today and then to be asked to speak about that, um, it's really, really quite an honor that I, I, I very much appreciate. I am so proud um, of these kids. Sorry to call you kids. You're not kids. But, but, um, but, but to watch what they have done and put together um, in a way, I, I, I've traveled, believe me, I've traveled the circuit. Um, um, giving a lot of speeches to a lot of places, both when I was in the government and since I've been outside the government. And I can honestly tell you, um, without a doubt, that there is no conference that has been more professionally run or prepared for than this one today. So they do deserve a tremendous amount of um, Robert and Ethan and, and the team uh, that I met last night and I got a chance to talk to you. I, um, I, I think they do, um, you all do Creighton University a great deal of credit. Um, I can tell you that um, t speaking with these outstanding women and men um, and, and getting to know them a little bit, um, those of us that are, that are either on top of the hill or are beginning to go down the other side of it, um, we can be very, very sure that our future is in very fine hands. So, so congratulations to you all and, and, and a really wonderful job here. Um, I'd also like to recognize uh, Jeremy Fisher, um, who's our assistant director at Creighton uh, for the Hyder College of Business Career Programs. Um, Jeremy advises these guys um, in putting this, this event together. Um, again, I, to me, this is fairly unique. I understand that there are other universities, or it may even be a university in my home state that, that, that tries to play at this, not as well as you guys do, but... but um, I, I, I just think that um, Jeremy's leadership should be recognized, and, and I think um, he it really is a, a fantastic, um, fantastic way for the business community 
and a business college as important as the Hyder College of Business to interact. So, so, so thank you for that. Great intersection of academia and, and commerce. Um, and then finally, um, I, think, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't, if we didn't thank um, Union Pacific in particular, but also all of the other corporate and business sponsors that actually make this possible. Um, the commitment um, by, by the business community to an event like this, I think, I think speaks not only tremendously well of my former home, Omaha, um, but, but it also, it, it just speaks well of the business community that, that it is nurturing and, and caring for its next generation. So, so thank you um, to all of you at Union Pacific and, and also all of the other companies and, and uh, business entities that, that have supported this effort. So I thought, you know, it was, this, is, um, this has been kind of a difficult talk to make, I think. Um, I, I actually thought um, what I would do, um, and I hope for those of you in the business community, you'll, you'll, you'll bear with me a bit. I, I actually wanted to address principally um, the students in the crowd today, at least at first, because I thought it might be helpful for you um, to hear um, how a history major, right, um, at Creighton University ended up um, in a very large um, institution like Bank of America and uh, running a very important program for the, for the company. Um, when I was, uh, I remember when I was an undergrad at Creighton um, in the School of Arts and Sciences, which I adored, by the way, um, Professor Ross Horning, who, who was a legend in, in the history department, uh, Jerry Hoffman, who is my um, advisor, uh, Dr. Mihalik, others that were, you know, I mean, just absolutely first rate educators. Um, and when I went on to law school, uh, I had the same, Professor Volkmer and, and Eric Pearson and Dean Skolnick, um, all just fabulous people. But when I was in, in undergrad, it was funny because, you know, my colleagues or, you know, other students that were in the business school used to call us, what, School of Arts and Crafts, you know, you guys, you guys, does that sound familiar? I'm sure that still happens. Um, and, and so it, it may seem a little bit odd that, that a history major can find them find his way to, to, to being here. I remember um, when I was a senior about, it was probably about this time, maybe a little bit earlier in October of my senior year, I sort of woke up and realized, what am I going to do after graduation next May? And, um, and um, it's actually how I made it into law school. I just decided that, so let's put this decision off a little bit and, and, and go to law school. Um, and. Um, I think while, while the history was a, uh, if there, are there any history majors out there? I don't know whether there are or not, or anybody from arts and sciences? Hey, fantastic. <laughs> um, I think what, 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 what was interesting about that is that, is that, is that history taught me um, two things that I think were very valuable that, that I won't, I'll talk a little bit more about. But one is that we do learn from our past. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the past repeats itself. I don't think it ever does. But I think, I think anyone who isn't focused on what's happened before um, and takes that as part of the analysis to what's going to happen tomorrow or what's happening today and how to respond to that is, is, not, is not conducting a full analysis. And, and that, that lesson, aside from, from just the sheer intellectual and academic enjoyment of, of studying history, it actually was a lesson that I think was very valuable and could be valuable for you as well, even though you probably dreaded your uh, mandatory history classes that you had to take in order to, in order to get your degree. Law school was similar for me. I think, I think the one thing that law school taught me, even though I was a practicing, technically a practicing lawyer, although I was in-house for a number of years, um, I, I think that the um, thing that law school taught me was that I never really wanted to practice law. Um, but I would tell you that, that, um, that, that teaching me to think in a, in a critical way and, and in a way that, um, that perhaps is not taught outside of a law discipline um, has served me every single day of my career. And, and therefore, if you've are if you're, if you're got an inkling that you may want to um, study law, and, and go on and, and do that, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's, if, if, if you never practice law, you will take the discipline away of, of, of being able to analyze issues, spot them, um, analyze them, resolve them in, in what one hopes is, is generally a practical and, and reasonable way. 
Um, I, I, I have such fond memories of Creighton in the time here, and I, speaking with the, with the students last night, um, it's clear to me that they're having that, that same time. But I think it would be, it's important for those that are here, uh, you have to emphasize that, that I think one of the things that I learned um, when I was studying at Creighton was, was honestly how to be a social human being, right? And actually, actually work with other human beings. Because at the end of the day, even in a digital age, I'm, I'm still analog, guys, I'm sorry. I, I, I have one of these phones, I, I, but I, I'm at that generation where I just missed it, right? Where it isn't part of me. My, my kids, I watch them, they can do things on their, their tools that I, I can't even begin to think about. But, but I, I think even in a digital age, even when we communicate probably more by texting rather than human communication, human connection is, in my judgment, still today the key to success in any relationship, including a business relationship. And so take advantage of your time here to learn how to be social animals and how to actually relate to other human beings in a way that, 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 that really, really achieves what you want to achieve out of life, whether that's love, happiness, business, whatever it is, you have to learn how to deal with these other creatures that are, that are at your tables. And, and that's, that's an important lesson that I think I learned at, at Creighton. It's part of the Jesuit tradition, and I think that, that that is something you should carry away and emphasize as you go forward. And then, and then I think finally, um, the, the moral center that Creighton reinforced for me um, personally was, was something that I have carried with me my whole entire life. And that, and that actual moral center has served me every single day of my life, not only in my personal life, but in my professional life, and particularly in my professional life. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we go forward. So I left school, went to Chicago, really because I was a Cubs fan, believe it or not. Um, I didn't have a job. Um, and and, I, and I, I started hitting the streets in Chicago. And, and, I, and, and what I would tell you is that that's hard work, particularly when, you, when the rent's coming due and you're not, you don't have anything coming in, right? You see, you see your savings dwindling and everything else, right? But, but, but I eventually got a job with, a, with the United States Treasury Department with ATF, which um, was a very exciting and, and wonderful career. And I was an in-house lawyer for them. So we did a lot of, lot of uh, support for, for their mission. Um, I still can't believe I gave, the, gave up the wine gig. That was um, one of the better gigs I've ever had. But, but um, it, was, it was something that I didn't, I didn't really anticipate. It came from an internship in law school at the US Attorney's Office here in Omaha. Um, I, I, you know, had no idea that I would be interested in this, in this area of sort of um, trying to interdict crime um, and, and even, even regulate, I guess. And, and that internship at the U.S. Attorney's Office um, led me to that and led me to focus my job efforts in Chicago with, with agencies of the government to try to gain that experience, I guess, um, that, that, that one needs in order to, to be able to have a career in that, in that. whether it's on the defense side or on the, or on the, the government side. And um, I, think that, I think what's interesting is that, um, that in, the, in this, this is what I think I'm so proud of this college for. Um, I, was, I was speaking with Jeremy a little bit. You know, it's, it's somebody told me an interesting stat that we've almost have more intern, internships available that, that we have students to actually fill them. And, and I would tell you if you're a student out there and if you're not taking advantage of that program, you're out of your mind because, because that practicality that you will learn and, and, and the, the work that you do, and when these companies or entities make these internships available, that I can tell you when we, when we have an intern at, at Bank of America, it's one of my favorite things in the world because you actually get to nurture somebody who is, who is going to take your place someday, right? And, and I suspect that, and I hope, that most of you who have engaged in those, in those internships have found that those are actually really, in many ways, such great practical experience that, that, that you have and so important. And, and that actually led me, was the thing that led me to my career. I would have never guessed 
that I was interested in federal law enforcement. Um, and I went to work for Tom Talkin at the, at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I think he became magistrate. I'm sure he's off the bench now, but, um, but, he, but he actually um, inspired me to do that. And, and I would not have done that had I just stayed and studied my senior year of law, right, without that internship. So take advantage of those programs. Anyway, I got to, got to um, ATF, and I ended up taking a job in Washington, um, which, was, which was, again, fascinating and, and good. And I worked my way up to the Deputy Chief Counsel's Office, which was a great gig then. And, and, and ATF was one of those agencies, um, as most Treasury Bureaus were, that once you sort of get into a chain, you can just, you know, you sort of replace the person that, that leaves, right? You know, it's a, if you're doing your, a really good job and if you keep your nose clean, it was, they would promote from within rather than have people come from outside generally, unless there was a, a big problem. So I, I actually was sitting, I was young for my age to, to be in that position. I was in the senior executive service in the government. That probably means nothing to any of you, but it was a big deal. And, and I thought, this is great. I've got a wife, two kids, we're happy. We're in Arlington, Virginia. It's a great place to be. DC's exciting. And I thought I had my career ahead of me. You know, maybe be the chief counsel someday, maybe do something from a policy perspective in the agency, but, but you know, be there. And out of the blue, um, right when I was hitting my stride as deputy chief counsel, they pulled me up and gave me a chair to keep warm at the Treasury Department, which was our mother agency, um, to, um, to w during, the, during the Clinton Bush transition, which is what happens in the government at the political agencies, is that once the, the, the administration that's leaving starts to leave, everybody starts to go, and the, the place still has to run, right? So they pull the civil servants up from the various agencies, and you keep a chair warm, is what they call it. Um, and you keep the agency running while, while, the, while the new team comes in in transition, right? And then you kind of teach the new team about the, about the practice. Um, as I came in, um, I was working for the new general counsel uh, of the Treasury, a guy by the name of David Alphauser, um, who turned out to be um, my greatest mentor. And that's another thing um, I would tell you to think about as you go out there is find your mentors. Because everybody has them. Nobody does any of this. Nobody who's successful, in my judgment, does any of this without help and without guidance and without mentorship. And David, for me, while I've had many mentors, David, for me, was the critical one that I would not be where I am today but for David Alphauser. So, so, and I'll tell you how I got with him, is, is that what was interesting is um, we, had a, we had a matter, um, you, may, you may or may not remember this, but there was the, the McVeigh bombing, which was a terrible event um, in the country. The FBI had been accused of not turning over some, some information to the defense that was exculpatory, which is a big no-no um, in, in criminal legal circles. And David came in, and he was new, and, and we were keeping chairs warm, me and the woman that was my boss at the time. And, and David said, well, what about Treasury agencies? We had five Treasury enforcement agencies all involved in the investigation of the Oklahoma City bombing. What about that? Our, you know, who's, what do we know about Treasury? I need you guys, I need one of you two to um, go and, and figure that out. And my boss took a big step backwards, right? And I was, I was in front and, and staying there, and so I, I said, okay, I'll do it. And she walked out and she told me, you better be careful here. This is political. You're going to get killed. You know, you better, you, better, you better see if you can get out. You know, and I, I just said, look, I got a job to do, right? There was a time when, when if you walked in my office at the Treasury, you could not see me. I, I had boxes of documents, um, literally 30, 40 feet high. It was, it was unbelievable. But we got through it, and we were able to prove that um, through hard work, diligence, um, and, and cooperation from the agencies, we, you know, we got through it and we were able to prove that the Treasury agencies had indeed turned everything over that they were supposed to turn over. So that if somebody came and asked, we were prepared. And, and David really liked the job I did. So I was headed back to ATF and, and he told me, he said, um, the day I was ready, I was gonna go back. In fact, I'd called my secretary in, in, um, back, at, back at ATF, and I said, okay, just get me ready. I, I, I need to get briefed on what's going on. And you know, so she was arranging all these briefings. He pulled me up into his office, and he said, how would you like to stay and be my chief of staff? And that's a political job. So I actually went from being in the civil service to, into a political role um, 
And, and that was, and I jumped on the opportunity. It was one of those where I, I couldn't say, let me think about it, or I better go talk over this over with my wife, right? It was, it, was, it was just one of those that I felt instinctually, this is, you better take this, right? And, and I did. And David um, turned out to be just, just an unbelievable mentor. But what, what happened was when 9-11 hit, um, the president appointed Secretary O'Neill um, in, to be in charge of the terrorist financing piece of the effort against, against terrorism. And Secretary O'Neill appointed David, and you know how stuff runs downhill, right? So I was, I was David's point person, um, and we actually coordinated um, every federal agency that had anything to do with finance um, and terrorism uh, through a National Security Council uh, Policy Coordinating Committee, and we actually did that. So we were coordinating the CIA, NSA, FBI, uh, state, defense, um, um, Treasury, all of those agencies, and trying to come up with a cohesive policy for um, the U.S. government on terrorist financing, and which, which I must tell you, was was such rewarding work. It was the time when I would sit there. You know, we, we used to have a, a briefing every Wednesday with the National Security staff in the White House in the Situation Room, right? And you've all seen the Situation Room. Believe me, it's not what it looks like on TV. It's actually there's conference rooms at the Hyder College of Business that are 50 times nicer than the Situation Room in the White House, I can guarantee you. Um, but I remember getting there the first time, going through the Secret Service gate and going into the West Wing, and, and actually seeing Colin Powell standing there and shaking hands with him and talking with him for a few minutes. And I just sat there and I go, how does this happen to a big dumb kid from Nebraska, right? And, and to be involved in this at this time. And so, and so, because I, you know, I, it was, it was just amazing, and it was an amazing time to be, to work for your country and do what, what we believed was really, really good and exciting work. And, and David, um, David really taught me um, how to coordinate at that level, and he taught me um, what was important and what wasn't, how to communicate. Um, we, we did a lot of work on the Hill during that time. Um, and, and so gaining an experience on, on, on Capitol Hill and, and that work you're going to hear from David later on, and he's, he's got that, and that's fascinating stuff, right? So, um, but, I, but I would tell you that, that um, you know, I'll never forget going up to New York. Um, well, we were, we were actually, I'll tell you this quick story. We were actually in London um, when it happened on 9-11. David and I, he was giving a speech at Cambridge, and... Um, and what happened was all the flights got canceled, and we thought, geez, there must be a hurricane on the East Coast. And then we learned that the country had actually been attacked. And, and somebody had told us, you know, you know how news is when something like that happens. Somebody had told us that the Pentagon had been blown up. Well, I lived less than a mile away from the Pentagon at the time. And so I think the Pentagon's the largest, one of the largest, I think it's either the largest or one of the largest office buildings in the world. So if they blew the Pentagon up, um, I'm thinking that had to be something really big. I may not, you know, so we're desperately trying to call back home and you couldn't get a line. We sat there for an hour and a half on the phone trying to get, trying to get a line. And um, finally I got through to my wife and confirmed that everybody was alive. She, she called on the cell phone to David and everybody was fine there. So, and then we, we drove into London, got a hotel room. We were on an Air Force flight back to the United States the next day and life began. That's, that's what 9-11 was like. I remember going to New York a week after the, after the, the attacks and, and seeing the devastation that happened in Lower Manhattan and actually thinking to myself that if there is a hell, this is what it has to look like and smell like. The smell uh, still to this day of burning steel. If you've ever been to Gary, Indiana in the steel mills, that's what it smelled like. And, and, and it, it just was an absolute picture of horror, right? But that motivation to, to be part of that and to be in the right place at the right time, right, for me, was, was so very special and so, and so, so keen. And that, that's something else I want you to think about is, is be open, open to serendipity. Be open to being in the right place at the right time. That's, that's something to think about as you go forward because, because if you take opportunities when they're offered, 
right? If it feels instinctually right, be open to that because it's amazing what, what can happen. Again, I'm, I'm not the sharpest tack in the box, there's no doubt about it, right? Um, I work hard, um, I, but, but I gotta tell you, there's, there's, there's thousands of people, there's probably 700 people in this room that have more intellectual capability than I have, but, it's, but I will tell you, I will tell you that, that um, being in the right place at the right time and then doing the work um, gave me something that I will never forget and always treasure. Then at Bank of America, um, you know, the opportunity came to, to, to take over FinCEN and, and roll out the USA Patriot Act and then Bank of America came. And since that time, I've really learned that, that one of the great aspects of the work that we do in, in the compliance end of finance, so if any of you are interested in this, you should, you should contact me. Because what we really do and what we're trying to do, you know, people talk about anti-money laundering, they talk about economic sanctions, or bribery and corruption, and everybody thinks we're chasing bad guys, and we are. There's no question about that. And working with law enforcement to get the bad guys out of the system and to protect the firm um, from those bad guys. But, but I have to tell you, the real thing that we're doing, if you really think about it, and, and the real aim of the anti-money laundering uh, statutes and the economic sanction statutes is to really provide for a transparent financial system which is critical, critical to commerce in the world. Because a transparent and fair financial system that isn't being gamed by people, right, makes it fair. Then, when it's fair, to the winner goes the spoils, right? That's what capitalism's all about. That's what, that's what free markets are all about. But they don't work if they're being gamed. And if you have that situation where things are being gamed, that's a, that can be a real, that can be a real problem. So that's, in essence, what we do. And the plumbing that we have, and the plumbing that we look after, right, to keep that system there, moves the world. And that's, that's the, that's what, what I've come to learn, is that it, it, there's an issue going on today because of the anti-money laundering pressures that actually people are, are, banks are beginning to do what they call de-risk and they're, and they're beginning to get rid of relationships in certain areas of the world and, and stuff. And, the, and banks in those areas of the world are not able to clear US dollars and they're not able to, to gain access to the system. And what I will tell you is the, the gaining that access is absolutely critical to the world. That's how, that's how countries rise up, right? So, so working at that level, and again, thinking about that, not from the tactical, let's go get the bad guy, but actually helping the financial system be better and more transparent is, is, is a mission that, that has kept me engaged for the last eight years, and I, 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 I get bored easily. So, and so far, I, I really haven't. So quickly, I've got seven pieces of advice for you that I'm just gonna run through quickly. Um, first, um, Tend to the human relationships um, that matter to you, whether that's family, friends, business colleagues, whoever, tend to them. In the digital age, you are gonna be pulled every direction that you possibly can be pulled. And it never stops, I can tell you that. Everything is global, the clock, somewhere people are doing business and they're sending you stuff and you can work 24 seven and never stop. Tend to the human relationships that you care about, uh, family, friends, and, and other colleagues. Two, learn how to express yourself in writing. Again, this may be my analog uh, uh, speaking, but I will tell you um, what we see from young kids, if I were gonna criticize young kids today, is that nobody can write the English language anymore. Tend to that, learn, learn how to express yourself in crisp, clear English. It, it will serve you very, very well. There's nothing more frustrating, even in email, where you see people with, with poor English and you don't communicate well, and communication in the information age is the key to success. So learn how to express yourself in writing. Three, if you're working long hours, load them at the beginning of the day, not at the end. Right, learn how to get up early. I think the rhythm in college, if I remember it right, that wasn't the rhythm, right? So when you get out there in the business world, I think you will see it's probably, for most folks, just the opposite. But if you're gonna put in long hours, and my guess is many of you will, 
Load them at the beginning of the day, not at the end. You're going to be fresher, sharper, and more productive at the beginning of the day than at the end of the day. That's true for most people. Four, be open to serendipity. It's what I told you before. Even if it appears unorthodox, be open to something that, 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 that could happen that, that, that you're just not sure, but be, be open to that. Five, pay it forward. Give back. Find your way to give back, whatever that is. There's traditional ways to give back. There's unorthodox ways to give back. Find a way to give back because you will be a happier human being if you give back. Six, make life decisions from the heart and make them in the now. The best piece of advice I have ever received is from a Jesuit father here at Creighton University, Father Dick Hauser, who taught me how to make big life decisions. He said, you analyze the decision all you want, get the facts, understand it, but when you've done with the facts, clear your brain, connect with here, because this is where God lives with you. Find out what's right for you at this moment in time. You can't make a decision based on the past. The past is the past. It's history. It's over, right? It's part of the analysis, but it's over. Don't make a decision based on the future because no one, no one knows what the future is going to hold. If you follow that advice, and I have to a T, and it has worked, for me anyway, you will never make a bad decision. You can't make a bad decision because you're making a decision in the now. And you're going to get presented with a lot of life decisions in the coming months and years. So make that decision that way. That's, that's great advice. Um, and then finally, and this, and this is the transition into the theme of the conference, is always, always have the courage to take a stand and do the right thing, right? People are drawn to people who have the courage who will take a stand to do the right thing. If you're taking a stand to augment your own personal career, that doesn't work. If you're taking a stand for political reasons or whatever, that doesn't always work. But if you take a stand to do the right thing and can articulate why, I will tell you people are drawn to those people like moths to a flame. So, so always have the courage to do that. And it will take courage at times, but do it. And that's, that's, that's what I kind of want to leave uh, with us here. Because I, I, think, I, I think I would ask the question as we begin this conference, what does it mean to inspire ethical leadership? Right? You know, it is so right that this remarkable institution, Creighton University, is the home for this symposium that poses a question like this, in my view. Because that's the, that's the gift that this institution gave me. It gave me a moral center from which I can take that stand, and I can do the right thing, and I can influence my institution, the people I work with, my family, others to do the right thing. And that's leadership, is being able to influence and get that to happen. It fits perfectly with the philosophy of the Jesuits embodied in the simple phrase, ad majorum dea gloriam, for the greater glory of God. If you read, if you read St. Ignatius's writings, what the summary of this idea is that, is that any work that is not evil, any work, even one, even work that would normally be considered inconsequential to the spiritual, can be spiritually meritorious if performed in order to give glory to God. And so when you think about that, what's really truly inspirational about this theme and about what we do is that all commerce is good inherently. Right? Everything that we engage in, if you're a business leader and you employ people, the good that's coming from employing those people, you're feeding mouths, you're, you're giving people lives and happiness. Union Pacific, think about this for a second. What they do for our country and the, the enablement that happens because of those rail cars that ride on those rails, right? Financial institutions, again, I talked about this before, I'm, I'm awed at what financial institutions, the exponential power that a financial institution can have for its community or for, the, for its clients, 
right? Because, because they, can take, they can take money, put it to work, and, and actually make lives better because of that. So, so at the fundamental core, what commerce is all about is making lives better. And if commerce is done ethically, it's really the only form of commerce that's sustainable. Because if it's, if it's not done ethically, it will not sustain, one way or another. It will either wither and die, or you'll get caught and you'll end up in jail. This is the key to, 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 this, to this symposium. And, and if I were going to leave you with anything, you, are, you all, especially you students, are at a huge advantage. Because if you were like me at Creighton University, you already have give, been given the foundation to go out there into the world and to make that happen. So have the courage, go do it, enjoy the day. Thank you again for having me. This has really been a treat for me. I hope, I hope you didn't find this too boring, or, um, or, or, and I hope you found it relevant, but, but the best of luck to you. If you ever want to talk about Bank of America, you make sure and give me a call. Thank you.